I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Isabel Brocas. She is a professor of economics at the University of Southern California, where she directs the Los Angeles Behavioral Economics Laboratory and the Theoretical Research in Neuroeconomic Decision-Making Institute. Isabel, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So neuroeconomics is a very new field, is that right? Um, not that new, it has been here for several years, uh -huh. but um, I mean, it takes time to really develop fields when they are interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary research is really hard because you need a common language to work with people. Yeah. And um, economists are usually not super open to new things, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it has been kind of difficult for economists to enter the field and to make their colleagues understand that this is important. And I, th I think that, well, still we're not there. A lot of economists would, would argue that we don't need to know anything about the brain to understand decisions. I think we do need about the brain, but this is, this is a work we still have to do with economists to try to convince that this is really important. Yeah. So before we go into things, maybe we should define neuroeconomics. So, you know, in some sense, it seems obvious. It's in the name. It's like economics plus neuroscience. But maybe we could talk about what specifically uh, this field aims to capture that neither that neither could do independently, that you couldn't get from pure neuroscience or from pure economics research. So, um, so it's a combination of economics and neuroscience, of course, in topics that are relevant to economics, which is decision making, mm -hmm. economic decision making. But I mean, this is a very broad um, label because you know, anything that has to do with risk-taking, um, making choices in intentable settings, but also strategic interactions with people. All these things mm -hmm. are about economics. So the question is, how do people make decisions? Mm -hmm. And in economics, traditionally, we, 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 we have a theory, um, a theoretical model, where we have pretty much axiomatized things in order to capture the behavior of people. And um, so this model, which is the rational model, there are sets of axioms that behave you should satisfy for people to be rational. And what we see normally is that people are not rational that way. So what economists have been doing traditionally is try to run some experiments and try to see whether we can somehow change these axioms and change the way we model decision making mm -hmm. to make it fit better behavior. But normally it doesn't work that well because you find a new model that explains one anomaly, but it does not explain another anomaly. And the question is, well, why is it the case? We, we cannot really have a new model that does a good job on relatively similar issues. And the idea is that, well, you know, it's because there are things that cause our behavior and we don't understand these things. And in particular, how we process information. When we have to make a decision, you have to choose between an apple and a banana. Well, it's not, you don't have a value for an apple and value of a banana. You have to compute this. So you're, mm -hmm. you're looking at it and this information goes to your brain and it's decomposed. And then, well, you're gonna be making a choice, but I mean, this choice might be also depending on whether you're hungry right now. So you have a lot of biological mechanism that that interfere and that makes that maybe today you're going to reach for one and another day you're going to reach for another one. And these are these processes that determine behavior. So there are a lot of other things that are relevant. So actually there is a bigger literature in economics, which is called non-choice data. So here the thing is just to see, well, we, if we just look at choices, well, we don't have enough information to really inform better models. We need to look at all the things that are not choices. So it could be, I don't know, if I'm stressing you out and I can measure stress response, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then, well, it might be that it affects your attitude toward risk. So some people are, for instance, trying to look at these non-choice measure. And neuro is one kind of non-choice measure, which is to look at what's happening in your brain when you're making decision. So this is, this is I would say, from our perspective of economics, it's a kind of one of these non-choice data kind of research that people are now trying to work on. Um, um, and this particular non-choice is about looking at what's happening in the brain when we make decisions. That was an excellent overview. Thank you very much. So you were trained as a classical economist, right? Before the neuroscience research came in, into play? 
Yeah, uh, I've always been interested in biology, psychology, um, I mean, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And somehow I ended up in economics, but maybe this is not what I should have done. You know, when you're a teenager, you choose things. And sometimes you just put yourself in some path that may not be the, the best one. So somehow I'm kind of going back to things that I'm really interested in, which is to understand behavior and understand all these mechanisms that lead to behavior. Mm -hmm. And my, my idea is really that human beings, we are a machine. And, um, and whatever we do results of a lot of very complicated biological mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, what is interesting about economics is that economics has a very interesting tool, um, theoretical tools in particular way of modeling things that are really useful in order to discipline the kind of data you can, you can find. And so it's, it's um, yes, it's, it's actually, it has been a good thing for me to do economics because I've been able to learn all these tools that can, now I can apply this toolkit to study things that I'm really interested in. Yeah, so behavioral economics seems quite similar to psychology, but is, is one way of conceptualizing the difference that economics seems to generalize, to generate theories first and then aim to apply those theories to individuals and then psychology might look at individuals first and then aim to generalize theories from the individuals. So it's like the ordering is different. Yeah, that might be, yes. That might be a good way of, of it's somehow, yes, it's a kind of slightly different approach and somehow different methodology. I think that in general, psychologists are interested in I mean, and of course, I mean, these things change and, and, and not everybody would agree and it's very difficult to really generalize anything. Mm -hmm. But I think very often psychologists are interested into, into phenomena, even in these phenomena are isolated. So you find a set of data where people are doing something weird, they are super interested into it. Mm -hmm. While economists really care about generalizing things, about having big models. So we're not interested in in general, in the in the in the details of the fact that there is this person who is doing these weird things, or this group of people who are doing this weird thing, we want to see whether there is some general pattern there, because we care about perhaps intervention, about giving some ideas how to fix problems of how to fix markets, and if we if we if we approach this thing from a behavioral econ perspective, it's always going to be well, you know, people are doing these things. Actually, it's a pervasive problem, so that's why we have to address it, and we have maybe to fix that particular market because, because it's important at a societal level. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you mentioned an interest in biology. Does this overlap with evolutionary theory at all? Because we tend to think of economics as money, but you could also think about it as resource gathering. And then from an evolutionary perspective, we, we have these certain incentives to maximize uh, reward and minimize punishment, so to speak, to, for our, from a survival perspective. Uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I haven't thought exactly about it uh, in those terms, but yeah, probably a lot of behavior um, is driven by evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I mean, I think this is this is true that we we have a set of institutions and we have a set of goals that are just things we have developed um, mm -hmm. through evolution in order to be able to survive and to adapt to our environment. So yes, mm -hmm. but I don't really work exactly on this kind of um, topic. Mm -hmm. Does game theory come into your work at all? It does. Um, so again, because I'm traditionally an economist, I've been starting working on topics that were purely in economics. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of my research initially was on modeling. Uh, of interactions between people. And actually my work in neuroeconomics is about modeling the brain as modeling the interactions between different systems. So this is a game theory problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, fi I find the, the overlap between game theory in the traditional economic sense and then also evolutionary game theory fascinating because you see a lot of similar dynamics at work. Although I know that's, that's not an area of your expertise so we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. Um, now, a lot of your work also... Yes, it, it's related. It's related, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the approach is slightly different because mm -hmm. in, in game theory, you really consider that the person is making a strategy all the time. Uh -huh. Why in evolutionary game theory, the strategies are fixed. They just some kind of compete to adapt. Uh -huh. um, so it's um, the, the, the method is different, even though, I mean, they are, they are of course, I mean, there is, there is something similar in, in the methodology that we mm -hmm. use. 
Right. So when, when you're looking at strategies of decision making, does it tend to be from a perspective of people are sort of on the fly creating new strategies? Or is it more like various strategies kind of exist out there and then we can either discover them or apply them? So this, so you see all these questions are super interesting. And this is where I think all these fields merge. Um, mm -hmm. The traditional game theory is, well, you're a person and you decide on the fly of your strategy, which is the best to respond to the particular problem you're mm -hmm. looking at. So this is how you conceptualize things. However, when you look at people, people how they make decisions, it seems to be that sometimes they are going to be I mean, the way you want to think a little bit about it is more as a system one, system two kind of story where you have a set of things, which is, you have, for instance, a bunch of heuristics mm -hmm. and you can pick one of those, or you can decide to really pick a good strategy on the fly to make your design your strategy, but it's co a cognitive effort that you should, that you should um, invoke. So my, my, my work in neuroeconomics would be more under this kind of approach, that there is an easy way, you pick a strategy which is mm -hmm. very simple and it evaluates things maybe not perfectly, or you can spend resources and you can, you can do something that is more a best response in the standard game theory approach. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's the good way of thinking about, about how people make decisions normally. Mm -hmm. And your work also takes a developmental component, is that right? Looking at children and how they develop these strategies? So yes, so I'm working a lot with children because here the idea is that, I mean, there are many ideas. It's interesting first of all to look at children because children are interesting mm -hmm. per se, uh, and they have also problems that we, 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 we want to solve as economists, I think. Uh, so just understanding children is, is something interesting per se, but from a more fundamental perspective, when you see at all the behavior of adults, we have to think about it as an end product of development. Mm -hmm. So when we look at decision-making in adults, game of strategies or individual decision-making, you see a lot of biases and there are patterns. Okay? And in some setting, adults do very well. So they do actually something very rational. They would play like, like um, suggested by game theory. Uh, in some other cases, they don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why is it the case? Is it because we are educated to not be able to learn how to solve these kind of problems? Or is it because there are some limitations? So behavioral theories, in general, what they try to do is to model limitations. But it's kind of complicated. You have a lot of competing theories that each of them is capturing something interesting for one particular problem, but then you try to put it in another problem, it does very poorly. Mm -hmm. So the question is, well, how to try to understand these differences? Why are we becoming adult, unable to solve this problem and very able to solve that other one? And if you look at kids, you look at the developmental trajectory uh -huh. and this helps understand whether there is maybe a point at which they stop learning or whether they knew already, which actually is interesting from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. You see that people somehow, they know how to solve some problems very early on, right? So somehow we have been developing um, an ability to solve certain kinds of problems. So for instance, markets, mm -hmm. uh, people know how to trade very intuitively. So mm -hmm. how is it? Why? Because it's really complicated. If you look at at the way people behave on markets, you try to model that from an econ perspective, it, it's gonna be very complicated models that you need a lot of structure to be able to solve what's going on. So these are extremely complicated models and you see people in a split second, they get to an equilibrium and then you play this with kids and you see that very early on, they know how to trade, they know how to barter, but also they know how to find something and use it as a, as, a, as a commodity to exchange against other things. So they know how to make money out of something just to trade. So, so, so this is really interesting to see that for this, the fact that we're very good maybe at solving this market situation, it might be because it's totally hardwired. Mm -hmm. um, but for other things that are very simple games that are very easy to solve from a game theoretical perspective, it's just, you know, you have to compare two things. People are not able to do it sometimes. 
-huh. And the question is, is it because they never learn or is it because they, they're stuck somewhere uh, during development and it just somehow it's probably a limit in our way yeah. of processing information? Yeah, and there's that classic nature nurture debate about to what extent is this behavior shaped by these individual differences or genetics and then yeah. uh, to what extent it's shaped by environment and how we were taught and so on. Yes, so so the nature nurture um, debate is really interesting and uh, so many things we see in kids that there is a lot of heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this heterogeneity, yes, might come from genetic components, but also may come from, um, from the way they are educated. So in order to try to say a little bit more about this, what we do is try to compare kids in different environments who have different SES, for instance, and try to see whether you see these differences within environment or across environments. And sometimes you can address a little bit these, these questions. And this is really complicated to, to tear these things apart. Uh -huh. So starting from universal, and then we can go narrower. So first, look, are there any uh, reliable, um, I, either different differences in children's decision-making strategies or maybe errors that they commonly make that you see um, reduce over time or change over time? So I think that in general, the way... Um, Okay, so it depends a little bit on the paradigm as well. But if you look at, for instance, game theory, the way we strategize, uh, strategic decision-making is complicated. It requires different things. It requires, it requires a lot of logic and it requires um, the ability to put yourself in the shoes of others. When you are playing against somebody or with somebody, you have to try to read the mind of that person. What is this person going to do? Mm -hmm. And then you have to try to best respond to what you think that person is going to do. So it is kind of logical. You have to deduce logically what the person is going to be doing. So you have to mentally put yourself in the shoes of that person to apply logic to, I mean, what is in, in, in the interest of that person. And then try to see what is in your interest to best respond to that. It's more complicated than that because you have to take into account that that person is supposedly doing the same thing about you, yourself. So maybe you say, well, they want to do this, then I should do that. But they know maybe, maybe they have anticipated that you want to do that. So you, maybe you should do something else. So it's complicated, actually. It's extremely mm -hmm. hard. And obviously, well, when you, when you look at behavior in children, you would see that kids are going to be doing these kind of calculations better and better in parallel to the development of this theory of mind mm -hmm. feature, which is this ability to put yourself in the shoes of others. But also the way they are going to be behaving in different settings is going to track the way of different kinds of logic. For some games, you need to observe what people do and then to make inferences from what you see and then play a game, right? Mm -hmm. So with inductive logic, you can play relatively well for these games. And you see that when kids develop inductive logic, they're going to do better. But for some other games, there are one-shot games where you don't know what the one is going to be doing. You need counterfactual thinking. You need to think about what the other one is going to be doing, but you don't observe anything about what they do. You have to make a decision without observing anything. Mm -hmm. So you have to do hypothetical thinking, and these things develop much later. And then you would see that the kids, well, actually, they don't do that well at all uh, during elementary school, but then they start picking at these things and, and doing better. Still, generally, we see that there is a limit. So there is, there is a level where everybody is stuck. But you find also other setting, like um, anything that has to do with randomization and playing mixed strategies, where, um, so these are kind of setting in which you, you, you don't want to play something for sure. You want to randomize because you, you don't want the person to figure out what you're going to be doing. So think about playing soccer and you are shooting um, well, you don't want the goalkeeper to know where you're going to be uh, um, shooting your 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 ball because otherwise he would just he would just go to that and 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 he would intercept it. So you want to be unpredictable, okay? So there are many situations in life where you want to be unpredictable, and what the best strategy is is to play in mixed strategies, which is with certain probability something or something else. And you see, for this, everybody is really bad at doing that. And it does not develop ever. Does it, de does it depend on your numerical skills? 
Probably not, because it doesn't seem that there is a link. Uh -huh. There is not many difference um, within grade, for instance. You wouldn't see that some kids are better at that mm -hmm. uh, necessarily. And in adults, uh, you would not see also much uh -huh. difference, individual difference. So yeah, this reminds me difference within grades and across grades. So that's really something we do really bad. Of course, if you train that, Right. Suppose you're a soccer player. Well, you train that intuitively. You know how to randomize because otherwise, I mean, you wouldn't be a soccer player. You have to be able to do this. Uh, and there is actually some some uh, some evidence and some some experiments on, on on these kind of things where you see what people are professional at doing some decision making. Actually, they do it well. Uh -huh. um, but but for this, it seems to be I don't know. It seems to be something we don't develop well mm -hmm. and maybe this is because we don't reason well in probabilities uh, and then will be interesting to see can we have an intervention where we teach people better to think in terms of probabilities to think in terms of being more random mm -hmm. maybe this would work but I, I do think there's something there this reminds me of one of my early podcasts with Nadia Chernyak she's a cognitive developmentalist and she looks at how children's numerical ability in very young children, like three to five, mm -hmm. relates to their conceptions of fairness. So it's like, if you're, if you're a very young child, before you know how to count, you can have a rough estimate of, you know, there's a pile of things, maybe there's three objects on one side, and there's five on the other side. And even if you can't count them, you can say there's more on the other side. But it seems like as your numerical ability develops, you start to, to use quantifiable estimates of fairness so even if even if you have very big piles where you can't tell visually that there's a difference in the amount of candy you have let's say if there's mm -hmm. 11 pieces here and 12 pieces here if you can't count it might look more or less fair but if you can count this starts to impact your perceptions of fairness so then similarly maybe you could extend that line of work to say once you once we're talking about more advanced mathematical topics like probability maybe that will influence adults uh, adults decision making as well yeah or i mean another thing we had thought about uh, regarding this is that we teach very early the kids to understand things in a deterministic environment mm -hmm. so for instance very early children we we make them do these um, tasks where you have a series of shape in a certain order and you have to predict the next one right and um, somehow maybe it frames them um, to think that everything is deterministic maybe we should have these kind of experiments where instead of having something the pattern that repeats over and over have a mistake here and there right mm -hmm. so that they have to predict the most likely things but it's not deterministic Mm -hmm. um, I think that generally people have problems with probabilities and, um, and I think that in general we do not teach probability early enough so that might be uh -huh. yeah this, this reminds me of a Bayesian test you might have heard of this so it's it's exploiting sort of our psychological heuristics so it's it's something like imagine a man who spends a lot of time in the library and he wears glasses he likes comic books things like that is he more likely to be a mathematician or a farmer? And most people are gonna say mathematician because it fits the stereotype very well. And then mm -hmm. if you add in some statistics about, I don't know how many mathematicians are employed in the US, maybe like 20,000, but there's hundreds of thousands of farmers. So statistically, once you take that into account, it seems more likely that, um, that, that he might be a farmer despite uh, the nerdy stereotype. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. And, um, and I think in general, yes, we don't teach people to make inferences. Mm -hmm. So they make very narrow inferences. And, um, and um, yeah, I think it's, it's really a problem because very often you have, I mean, we live in an environment that is, that is not deterministic. And uh, you have to try to make inferences from this and, and you have a lot of information that you can potentially take into account in order to make mm -hmm. a best guess, yeah. an educated guess. And people don't do that. They use heuristics. But I think some, somehow we train 
them to these heuristics more than to think a little bit more generally. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a bit about rationality and the idea of maximizing payoff. This is actually another thing that came up in that in that podcast with Nadia Chernyak when we were talking about quantifying fairness. So here's here's um, a hypothetical. Let's say I ask you to take my laundry to the dry cleaners and I say, if you do this for me, I'll give you $20. And nope. <laughs> whether you're going to do it for me or not, it's like, maybe you really need the money and maybe it's, it's not too bad. Maybe we could up the amount. But the point is, there's going to be some reasonable amount that you'll start to consider doing it. But then if I said something like, I'll give you $10,000, some people might just seem very excited, but then you'll think, wait a minute, are there drugs in this laundry? Like, why are you going to pay me so much for this simple task? So there's this skepticism that starts to come in. So it's it doesn't seem like we're motivated purely by maximizing payoff at some point. And I, I don't know of any research on this topic, but I suspect that children might be more likely to get excited by uh, an exceedingly large payoff and adults are going to more like are going to be more likely to start thinking, what's the catch? Okay, so from an economics perspective, um, we are, we're maximizing utility and you can put a lot of things in utility. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily only money, it could be pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have a utility function where you anticipate the risk of getting caught if there is uh, drugs actually in the laundry. So mm -hmm. you can have that in your system of reward and you maximize that. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, if you think people only care about money, you will think, oh, they shouldn't do this. But people don't care only about money. They care about all these things. And we can accommodate for that in, uh, in economics. Actually, this wouldn't be rational mm -hmm. to, 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 to care about this thing. It's not. It's just, it's just part of your system of rewards you're going to have. So you can, you can model utility function taking into account all these things. Uh -huh. So from a developmental perspective, would it be true that adults are more likely to think about long-term consequences uh, and, and be more skeptical of offers that seem good on the surface but might have hidden consequences? Probably because, I mean, it's, it's a question of what is the world you're looking at when, when mm -hmm. you are making the decision. And an adult might know of somebody who had some experience so they would start probably putting more in their utility function all these potential risks mm -hmm. where there is a probability that any of these things happen and when they see a trigger well then it enters the utility function otherwise maybe they, disc they, 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 they don't look at it don't think about it kids very often well you know their word is their world is very limited they don't have the same experience so probably they will not, okay, so they have two issues. For, the first issue is even conditional on what they know can happen to them. They don't necessarily think in terms of what's going to happen tomorrow mm -hmm. because they have problems planning and thinking ahead. Um, so, I mean, and again, for this, there is heterogeneity as well. And sometimes it also depends on, on how, how you frame the problems to them. If you, if, you, if you are clear about telling them, well, you know, something's going to happen tomorrow, they might actually process it and do even backward induction. Mm -hmm. But that's a different topic. But um, so they have this problem necessarily of, um, of planning because they, they don't have the ability to focus on maybe all the, the, um, the dimensions of the problem. So maybe they are going to focus on what is more salient and not on what might happen down the road. But on top of it, if they didn't have an experience of you know, being tricked, well, then they would not, wouldn't even represent that because uh -huh. for them it doesn't exist, which right. is always really interesting also. And sometimes you have to try to disentangle when you see the behavior of kids. Is it because they are not able cognitively to make these comparisons or it's just because, well, they're just not aware of things because it never happened to them. Uh -huh. And we develop both things as we grow. That is, that is very interesting. I haven't considered the lack of experience part of it, but that, that seems just as critical as the cognitive development aspect. So a related yeah. topic here we could talk about comparing children and adults is delayed gratification. Delayed gratification? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So I haven't been studying these particularly myself. Um, I mean, anything that has to do with time discounting in children um, 
I haven't been studying it much, first of all, because there is a huge literature already on that. Mm -hmm. And second of all, because they, it's really complicated to... I mean, if, I mean, I'm really interested in, in, in working with kids sometimes relatively young. Uh -huh. And when they are young, they have a problem with the conception of time. Right. Uh, very young kids, everything in the future is tomorrow. And everything in the, in the past is yesterday. So it's complicated to go and to make an experiment and to tell them, you know, I'm going to give you this today or this tomorrow. Do they represent what tomorrow is? It's not totally clear. Um, it doesn't mean that they have no conception of time. There is a lot of literature also that, that, that shows that kids, even, even infants, they, have, they know how to time intervals, for instance. They, they could compare if you give them to evaluate different intervals of time. You give them, I don't know, maybe some music uh -huh. uh, during three, three seconds and automatically 10 seconds, they would know which one is longer. So it's not that they have no notion at all. But... Now we're talking about not seconds, we're talking about days. So mm. how far is tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? And, you know, and, and in general, in time discounting, there is also all this problem. We have even these problems with adults, which are people very often, well, they're not sure you're going to be bringing the reward in a week or in a month, as you uh -huh. say, in experiment. So they might just say, oh, I want to think today because they know they're going to have it for sure, right? Uh -huh. So if you don't trust experimenter, you can have already this delay, of, no delay of ratification because because you don't trust the experimenter. Uh -huh. So so time, I think I think time is really complicated to study. So I haven't been doing yeah. anything specific on that, but I mean from the literature that is there, what we do see is that so there are different aspects in in these time preferences. One is patience, and the other one is inconsistency. This this, mm -hmm. this problem of uh, impulsivity that you really prefer things that are immediate mm -hmm. and it seems that both of these things develop people become more patient and also more consistent somehow less impulsive um, mm -hmm. so yes and this is probably I mean this is linked to the maturation of 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 the of the prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. uh, that is kind of playing a role in helping representing all the dimensions of the problem so that you do not jump in a and an immediate. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of the, the classic marshmallow test experiment that found that children who could delay receiving a marshmallow as sweet treat reward um, later down the line, they had better life outcomes. But then I also heard of more recent research that found that it might not have just been the delayed gratification and, and the cognitive control per se, but it also might have been that um, they, they came from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So they, they might have been learned strategies as well. Yes. Yes, it's a, it's a really fascinating study. Um, well, one issue with the studies, of course, is that, well, they started with a bunch of kids and then as they grew, a lot of people went out of the sample. So there is somehow a problem um, for, for identifying the, the effects. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, I think there is something there, frankly. I think there is, there is differences for sure in, 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 in young kids and probably if you leverage these differences, you're going to have differences later. So I'm not really um, concerned by the, the truth of the result, even though maybe there is not enough power sometimes. Um, but this is true that this is a very interesting um, experiment and many things can happen. It can be because, again, we're talking about little kids and something that can, can be also is you know, some, some, some kids are more obedient, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be, oh, an adult told me to wait, I'm going to wait. Yeah, so there yeah. might be other things, other, other reasons why these children may have waited and some children didn't wait. It's not necessarily only about impulsivity. Right. Yeah, I like what you said about not just being like, let's say a, a lack of patience, but also taking into account risk of what if the reward never comes. Um, I've, it, it seems consistent with some evolutionary theories I've heard uh, that you can tell I'm a fan of for personality trait conscientiousness, because you would think it would be better to just work hard and have this long-term outlook, but it only seems to work in a very stable environment, because if you're living in a very unstable environment, then it does pay off to, um, to consume as much as you can now in the short term. Yeah, that's an interesting idea too. Yeah. So 
what are some of the um, the new findings that have come out of your lab specifically from uh, the neuroscience component? Like, So in my lab, so with COVID, we have been a little bit stuck. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, the neuroscience component, um, let me see. So the most recent research we have been um, working on in neuroeconomics is um, a model to try to explain decision-making in the context of self-control, mm -hmm. um, discounting, but also it can apply to addiction. Um, and here, the underlying story is that there is um, a lot of literature in neuroscience on value. Mm -hmm. And value is just about how do we make decisions between two objects, right? And well, the brain is gonna be computing the value of these options and comparing these values and make a choice. So there is um, a lot of literature that says that the regions involved in this valuation, I mean, there are, pro there are many regions, but I mean, the, 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 the region that kind of summarizes the information about value and differences about value is the, is the ventral major prefrontal cortex. Okay, so there is a lot of literature on that. And then there is literature that says that, well, if we're talking about options that have a self-control component, um, so we see activation in other regions like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Right. And well, this is a part that is involved in, in working memory in a lot of cognitive functions. And um, so the underlying story is that, well, when you have a choice, which is not just, OK, I want to make a decision based on the taste of these two things. And I'm just going to take the one that is the tester. Suppose now you have a diet problem. Right. So you shouldn't be eating something with a lot of sugar. You have to think about that additional dimension. So you have to process this information. So I don't know, probably you have to retrieve that information from, uh, from your memory or try somehow to take some more information and input that with your interest in eating something that is good to you, tasty. And so um, there is literature that show that there is this interplay between, um, between these two systems, the VMPFC and the DLPFC. And actually, if you look at the system, you find that, well, you know, in anything that has to do with value, it's not only about eating things, it's about anything, uh, risk, any kind of setting, you're going to find this VMPFC. And uh, in, in many behavioral disorders, you're going to find in general also issues with disruptions of the VMPFC, but also disruptions of the DLPFC. So for instance, in problem of addiction, you will see that people have disruptions of both potentially. And so what it makes is that the valuation is done differently when you are addicted or when you have a behavioral disorder, an eating disorder, for instance, uh, and you probably do not represent the consequences of eating or consuming whatever good that is bad for you. So the DLPFC is not doing its job either. Mm -hmm. so, so what we have been working on is on a, is on a model that try to summarize these phenomena and try to understand under what circumstances the brain should involve the DLPFC uh, in the decision making. And the story is, well, you know, processing is really costly in the brain. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're going to eat something wrong for you because maybe it's not, it's not enough for you uh -huh. to thing really cognitively involve the DLPFC in order to compute how bad this is going to be. So very often people are going to have a very um, suboptimal behavior because, well, it's just easier to think in terms of the taste and maybe not bring these other dimensions mm -hmm. because of these costs. And obviously when you are on a diet, then you're going to be trying to invoke these regions more often and to exercise self-control. So you see that people on a diet are going to exercise more self-control in general. You're going to see more um, activity in these regions. So we were just kind of um, trying to model this phenomena and try to mm -hmm. predict 
under what circumstances people would exercise self-control or not exercise self-control. And what happens when you have a disruption of any of these regions? Mm -hmm. What kind of behavior results from these disruptions? And then it helps explaining what's happening in eating disorders and addiction. And in particular, explaining also why in those categories, you can't really tell them, oh, this is wrong what you do. You should do it differently because it's just, it's just a mechanism that is not working well. They don't process uh -huh. the information correctly. So it's not a matter of information. It's really a matter of um, uh, trying to create cues around them so that they're going to be triggered to have more cognitive um, um, processing. That is something that it would be more, more efficient. Or actually, there's some people who do uh, stimulation of the DLPFC. You have a lot of these uh, pioneering treatments where you are mm -hmm. trying to um, to activate some neurons in order to make sure that these processing is done better. And actually, these work relatively well. As, as far as the directionality goes, does it tend to be that people have these brain differences and then it's more likely, depending on those brain differences, to, um, to have different behavioral patterns or predisposition to addiction, let's say? Or is it more like the brain changes as a result of your habits. So neurons that fire together, wire together, and then you can either build up, a, let's say a better brain for self-control or a brain that's um, that's an addict brain, essentially, depending on, on the your past behaviors. So that is a very interesting question. And um, I think it is a little bit both. Mm -hmm. um, so, both. <laughs> so yeah, it's both because of, for instance, I mean, people who have, um problems of attention and problems of attention are problem with this dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex so for instance children who have ADD, ADHD might be slightly more likely to become addict or to develop something else that also involve that region mm -hmm. so it might be that the way your brain is so if you have problem of attention with which might be a combination of things right you don't, I mean, your neurotransmitter, you do not produce them enough, or maybe the receptors are wrong. There might be genetic factors. Obviously, there are genetic factors. So this thing is going to put you more at risk of something else. Well, of course, now, if you stay away from drugs, you will be fine. And if you have a good diet, you will be fine, right? Mm -hmm. But there has to be something which is your innate, I mean, differences, variations in in features in the brain are going to be associated causally uh, in, 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 in this tendency of developing certain problems. But then, of course, in the case of addiction in particular, if you start having drugs, it's going to affect the way your value system works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's going to affect these pathways. So if you take anybody who has a priori no reason to be drugged and you start drugging this person, you're going to make this person an addict. Mm -hmm. So you have both things because the brain is, 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 is reinforcing things. So you, you, you eat something and then you start being willing to eat it more. And um, so this is, this is actually how we develop probably everything. Uh -huh. uh, you, you expose to things and you, you, you like these things more. That's why if you are, are in different culture, you eat different food, well, you might never be willing to eat the food of another culture. Uh -huh. So addiction, this is what it does. It really uses this circuitry and it, and it makes that the more you are consuming this drug, the more you want to consume it. Yeah. So I know that in behavioral economics, there's a large body of literature looking at early interventions for children to improve their decision-making uh, capabilities. This seems to only double down on that because now you also have brain plasticity added into the mix. So the idea is that if you could develop optimal strategies at a young age, maybe that will um, train your brain, so to speak, for, for um, optimal decision making. So, I mean, something that is important about these early education um, interventions, I think it's true. I mean, if you, if you are placing children in in situations where they can optimize, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's it's I, I really think that there is a genetic component that somehow sets some bounds, uh, but but the environment can really make you reach these bounds. Right. 
And um, if you put people in a good situation, they are going to be able to be uh, developing good decision making. This is very important. But there is also uh, um, some evidence that's, that says that, well, these things have to be going on over and over. So for instance, you take young kids, you put them in a certain environment, thinking, mm -hmm. oh, now they are going to be really nurtured, they're going to develop their, their cognition, and they're going to be doing really good. Now they are out of this program and you put them in a crappy program and they stay there for the rest of that time. Well, all these benefits they had early are going to disappear, mm -hmm. right? So you need repetition of that. And I think this is going to be one of the big challenge. Um, of course, you can probably work more on children very early on than, for instance, if you have to choose between having um, an intervention on very young children or adolescents. Probably there are more returns if you do the little kids. But, well, you have to understand that well, you still to be, you need to be doing this intervention for a long time until they are able themselves, you know, to be independent. Uh, um, yeah. Because, because otherwise it's going, to, it's going to disappear. And I think they have seen sort of this with the Head Start programs, for instance, that, you know, I mean, it's really nice, but after a while, some effects might really disappear. Mm -hmm. In a recent podcast, I was talking with a clinical psychologist, Eric Nook, and I was asking him about resilience. And I'm wondering if this parallels into economics. So I asked him if more resilience is always better, especially in development. And he told me about this, um, dandelion theory. So the idea is that uh, it's not necessarily better to have higher resilience. Uh, it depends on the environment. So the idea is that if you have high resilience, you are more stable. So your range of possibilities or you, your, the amount your environments can influence you is narrower. And then children who we identify as low resilience will do poorly in a bad environment, but might thrive even more in a really nourishing environment. So the idea is they're like dandelions. They'll blow with the wind in either direction, and they'll blow more than um, the higher resilience, more stable kids. I'm wondering if you see similar phenomena in, in economics. Um, well, in economics, some people have been looking at grit. Mm -hmm which is not exactly the same thing, but related. Mm -hmm. This idea of perseverance. Um, and um, you would see that people have more greed or children have more greed are going to be more successful uh -huh. in general. Um, that's not something I have explored myself. Yeah. So I don't know super well that literature. Actually, when I, but, when I was asking if this maps on to econ, I, didn't necessarily just mean the resilience component, but the idea that some children are more heavily influenced by their environment than others. So the idea that um, the different developmental effects we were talking about, um, if there might be a range of impact depending on how how receptive, I guess, the children are to these to these different environmental effects. I think that is true, but it's true broadly. Um... So for instance, you, you might have some kids who are in families where there are a lot of books and they would take the books and the brothers won't, right? So, so yes, you see that some kids, they react more to the environment positively than others. I think this is, yes, this is, this is something generally true. And this is just because you have variations in, in behavior and, and children are gonna be different. Mm -hmm. and so some kids are going to make better use of some of these interventions than others. And the right. question is why? Why is it the case? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is, this, is, this is also coming back to this uh, nature versus nurture, which is, well, maybe there is an effect that nature makes you adapt and be nurtured better somehow. So, uh -huh. it is, so you know, they have some people who say, well, in the end, maybe it's just only nature. Probably some people say that. Because your gene might make you more likely to pick the book if you're in an environment where the book is there. Uh -huh. um, we don't know, but uh, but we do see yes that there are there is variations in this behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, one of the most surprising findings for me with that nature nurture debate was that genetic heritability of behavior goes up over time, not down. So for example, adopted kids become less like their adopted parents over time, which is contrary to what you'd expect, but it seems to be because as the um, gene epigenetic influences take over, you start to shape your environment more in line with, I guess, whatever your genes have in mind for you. Yes, uh, yes, this, this, these effects, um, the, these interactions between, between genes and, and development and time in general are really interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. So on the nature side, these innate differences, we can't really do much about them. We can just seek to understand them. On the nurture side, maybe we could close with this. What are some of the most useful interventions that are backed up by the literature that would help improve children's um, rational decision-making? That's a big question. <laughs> um, so first of all, I think that in order to really understand what we can do in terms of nurture, it's very important to understand nature well because you have to mm -hmm. control for nature. Mm -hmm. And maybe we don't know enough already in order to be able to control well for that and to disentangle the effects because you have a lot of interactions between these things as well, mm -hmm. um, which complicates all the, the stories. So I don't think that we can answer with a lot of precision. I think that we have, there are some interventions that I said before, for instance, um, if, you, if you have children in an environment where you engage them um, intellectually, but also you nurture them, you are giving them affection, um, it's gonna work. Right, I think this is this is evident. But I think another effect that is very important is to make sure that these interventions are very long and something we don't know now. And to me, this is one of the big issue. We don't know how long an intervention should be mm -hmm. on children to be really effective, because we don't we don't have we just have some some interventions and they do what they do and they are the kids are tested at the beginning of an intervention at the end of the intervention so you see if it's well sometimes you try to test them after and you see whether it has vanished or not and you can you can do this testing but we should also vary the length of these interventions to try to see whether should we intervene during the entire elementary school um so pre-k until end of elementary school or should we continue during so we don't know that. And, and I think this is, this is something that we have to investigate because otherwise maybe we're just having this intervention say, oh, you see it works, but then we're not gonna do it anyway, because so. Uh -huh. Right, and you have to deal with unintended consequences too. Like this reminds me of a, of a famous study of kids with conduct disorder. I think it was back in like the 1950s and they, they set up this summer camp for the kids with a whole bunch of learning and enriching activities that and you would think that their behavior is going to improve. They found out that by the end of the summer, the kids were worse on virtually all measures. And the, the idea was, if you want to improve kids, it's not just about the activities. It's about don't get a bunch of bad kids together for a whole summer, because then they're going to kind of just encourage bad behaviors. So that was an unintended consequence of that study. Yes, I'm not aware of anything like this in what I've read. But yes, of course, you have to... <laughs> You have to be careful about these things, but I mean, it's if if we want to improve, there are many things we can do, and we can we can also have interventions with the families. Um, there are so many things we could do, but to me, the issue right now is that we don't know what contributes best to things. So, is it, for instance, to give money to families, or is it to have better schools um, uh, with better teachers? I mean, if you start looking at all the the the, the the literature on education and all the problems there is and everything that has to do with inequality and uh, what's happening in, in, in poor neighborhood schools. There are so many problems of teachers who have racial bias, teachers, and they don't necessarily want that. It's just that it is the way they are. The thing that there are different kids and well, they just think this one is gonna have a worse behavior than this one, just because this one is black and this one is white, for instance. So you have all these problems you have also the fact that, and I think that's something that is easy to fix. Mm -hmm. Educators have no understanding in general of how the brain develops. And they don't have very good understanding in general of all the 
biological mechanisms that are that are that are relevant to really appreciate the behavior of of children and adolescents and that's something we could do a lot about we could we could really teach educators to know about what's going on in the head and in the body of the kids uh, that makes that you set expectations but they don't understand so for instance a little kid you ask them to stay still well maybe it's hard for them because they are little they can't an adolescent you ask them to have tons of things to review maybe they can't because they're going through puberty and it's really hard to do these things and you don't have this understanding in general educators don't know about this and then they don't know about what is the effect of poverty if you are a teacher in a poor neighborhood and you're not poor yourself you don't understand that all this stress is affecting the behavior of people and it's affecting education it's affected the fact that the kids come to school and they are stressed out they are not in a process thing the same way mm -hmm. so these are things easy to fix yeah training of teachers and educators in general and uh scientifically interventions we can empathy sorry scientifically informed empathy exactly yes yeah. yes because it's not just oh i'm gonna be nice just you have to understand what they are going through. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there are tons of interventions for, 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 and I mean, different interventions might have different kinds of purposes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but for instance, adolescence is, to me, is extremely tricky. That's something we should try to fix. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I think that somehow we have taken this path, we think it's easier or it's more effective to find solution in early education. It's easier somehow to implement things and we know it works relatively well, but we don't do enough for adolescents. And adolescence is a really difficult period for people, mm -hmm. for all people, for everybody in all schools. And, um, and I think we should really try to, to do things there in order to, to help adolescents go through school uh, because it's hard. And this is really a moment where a lot of things change. And again, this goes back to biology. This is a time where they start being depressed, anxiety develops, a lot of mental disorders develop. And the schools are not equipped for dealing with this. And obviously, if you have a poverty component on this, well, then this is even worse. But you see, adolescence is really the very... It's the transition uh, that is extremely hard for the kids. And probably this is where we have the least educated uh, educators. Because very often in early education, you would find teachers who have done a little bit of psychology, they know a little bit of the psychology of kids. Mm -hmm. But adolescents... The people who teach adolescents normally have no interest in this. They don't know anything. So they just go and they just see adolescents like a bunch of animals who are just running wild and are annoying. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and they don't have empathy. Why, you know, in general, in, in, in early education, educators have empathy. But for adolescent people don't have empathy. And this mm -hmm. thing just combines with this problem they are going through. And I think it's really, it's really, it creates a lot of, a lot of issue that we should try to solve. So interventions there should be also. Yeah, um, as, an, as an adolescent researcher myself, I agree completely. Well, you're not an adolescent. <laughs> <laughs> a researcher who studies adolescence. Okay, adolescence. so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Isabel. You're welcome.